it's my pleasure today to introduce Mikhail Karpokin from the University College London to be our speaker. And uh, Mikhail is a success story of the Montreal undergraduate program, having uh, graduated from uh, under the supervision of uh, Dima Jakobson and Yossip His uh, PhD thesis was uh, recognized by two awards, the Prize and the Canadian Mathematical Society Doctoral Prize. Uh, after the PhD, uh, Mikhail Karpokin was a uh, postdoctoral fellow in the Caltech at the QCRI and the QCRI. And uh, afterwards, he joined the Department of uh, Mathematics at University College London. And he's a specialist in geometric spectral theory and uh, related problems of optimized of minimal data and the minimal services. As we talk today on ideal values and minimal services. Please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation to speak. It's good to be back. Um, although many restaurants that I knew well are closed now. So, uh, but I'll find new ones. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about the um, eigenvalues and minimal services. So it's, um, I'm going to explain what both of those things are, what kind of minimal services, what kind of eigenvalues. You can only see a picture of a minimal surface. I'm going to explain what it is later. Uh, and then I'm going to connect the two topics. Uh, okay, so let's uh, look at what kind of eigenvalues we're going to be looking at. Uh, and uh, and once my pointer starts to work, uh, it's, never, it's, it's always good. Uh, all right, so we're talking about specifically eigenvalues of the operator. Um, and, and then start with, with, with um, um, some class and class object, object in the, the domain, domains in the invasion space. Um, and and the particular space, space okay. and RN, um, um, my, my plus, plus operator is just sum of second derivatives, and, and I'm adding minus the front. Right? So you, you probably used just the usual sum of second derivatives. I, I like to have minus in front. And so sometimes it's called positive Laplacian or germ just Laplacian. And it's a famous operator in mathematical physics uh, and geometry, it models many physical phenomena heat, sound propagation, and the particular problems uh, that I want to consider are optimization problems for eigenvalues. And there are sort of informal ways to introduce them. Uh, so I chose one of them. Uh, so for example, talking about heat, heat propagation. So suppose you have some container of fixed volume and isolated walls. So for example, ideal room in the winter would be an example. Uh, and then we know that uh, the temperature, uh, if you heat it up, the temperature eventually becomes equal everywhere, right? But then when you heat up the room, you want it to be temperature to be the same everywhere as soon as possible, right? So you don't want to heat it in one corner and then first in another corner would just freeze to death before the heat actually gets there, right? So you would like to, uh, for a room to have such a shape that it propagates the constant temperature as soon as possible. Right, and so that's the problem. Which shape would give you the fastest convergence to a constant distribution? Mathem mathematically, this problem is related to so-called Neumann eigenvalues. So, if our uh, if we represent our room as the domain omega, when we solve uh, this kind of eigenvalue problem, right? So, where you are solving for the interior, you're solving for Laplace u equals mu u. So, it's exactly the eigenfunction equation. And on the boundary, you have the isolated condition. So this is normal zero is equal zero. So U essentially represents the heat distribution. So it tells you that heat doesn't leave the room. Normal zero is equal zero. And then uh, if your omega is nice enough, smooth enough, for example, Lipschitz, then this uh, problem has a discrete spectrum, right? So what it means is that the values of mu for which there is a non-zero solution, they form a sequence like this. Right, so there's obviously a constant function, uh, which is, uh, which corresponds to nu equals zero. And I call it nu zero because it's always there. Uh, and the first interesting one starts with a new one. All right, and now the, the eigenfunctions will form an orthonormal basis and the eigenvalues will tend to infinity. So in general, this is very similar to the usual self-adjoint operators in linear algebra. Uh, the only difference is that there are infinitely many of them. Right, and the same, the same usual properties of eigenvectors still apply. 
right? As I told you that u0 is a constant function and that's the underlying reason for why uh, heat becomes equidistributed, right? So it's converges to the, uh, the first tagging function, so to zero tagging function, yeah. Omega is bound. Hmm? Omega is bound. Right, yes, yes. So for me, yes, omega is bounded, smooth, um, connected. So that's, uh, uh, there's only one constant function. Uh, and uh, the first tagging value represents the speed of convergence to the constant distribution. Right. You, can, you can try to get similar sort of uh, physical interpretations of higher eigenvalues, which sort of, they feel a bit forced. So it's kind of, the natural, natural physical interpretation is for mu one, the rest is kind of hard to come by. And so the, the original question becomes for which domain of fixed volume, uh, mu one achieves its maximum, right? So we want the speed to be as high as possible. Uh, so we want it to converge to constant distribution as fast as possible. And so the answer is given by the Sager Weinberger theorem. And it tells you that essentially what you suspect is that the round room should be the best. All right. So if you want to spend as little money on heating as possible, then you should make the spherical rooms. Uh, of course, it's inconvenient for other reasons, but um, if you only care about your, your bill for electricity for the gas, then that's what you should do. Uh, and so the story here is that Seagull proved it first for the, uh, for the plane, and then Weinberger two years later proved it for arbitrary dimension. And moreover here, the equality happens if and only if it's a ball, right? So the, the sphere is a, the only optimal shape. Uh, you can ask a question, so what about high eigenvalues? So the, of course, it doesn't have such a nice physical interpretation, but uh, in mathematics, it's a perfectly reasonable question to ask what happens for high eigenvalues. Um, and uh, it was proven not so, uh, not so long ago that indeed uh, the second eigenvalue is maximized by the following picture. So you take uh, two disks or two spheres, two balls of the same volume, and you connect them together by say a tiny bridge. Or if you don't care about the domain being connected, you can just leave them, leave them disconnected. Right, and the story is similar is that uh, uh, Alexander Giroir and George Fili and the Osipo Tiroj proved it uh, in two dimensions, so for, sort of following the method of Segur, and then later Bakur and Anro proved it in arbitrary dimensions following the method of Weinberger. Uh, so looking at this, you might ask what happens for, say, for the third eigenvalue with the three balls, for example. Uh, well, it turns out that after the second one, so if all hell breaks loose and it's kind of hard to say anything. So let me show you some numerical computations. All right, so that many people try to do sort of numerical picture for um, following eigenvalues, even in two dimensions. So this is just one of the examples. So it's just starting from, so this is the, from third up to 10th, I believe. So they sort of, they sort of have some sort of structure of, K balls, and then somehow round it up, right? So you, could, you can sort of see three balls in the first picture, kind of four balls in the second picture. They have some sort of symmetry, but identifying them explicitly is kind of difficult, right? So it's, it's not clear what to prove even, right? Is there a sort of good formula for the boundary of those things? Is there something you can prove about them, right? So it's completely, completely unclear and completely open. Right, so no one knows what to do. I don't think there's even consensus in the medical community what this shape should be. Right, so people doing different numerical experiments and they getting slightly different answers. Um, so somehow the moral of the story is that uh, this picture, while that's where the problem originated, sort of making further progress in this seems difficult. In particular, it's not clear what to prove. The fifth guy, it's, it's not a stadium, so the, the dot line isn't straight or not. It doesn't, if I look like this, it's not, <laughs> it doesn't look like a stadium. Yeah, it's sort of, it's a bit, a bit indented. Yeah. There's probably five balls in there somewhere. But I can't see them, yeah. So as I'm saying that even, even what I said before is not true, right? I said there's a, there's a K balls, but uh, here I don't, don't quite see five balls. 
And so it's very hard to formulate something about this that we can prove. Mm -hmm. Even if you formulate it, it's un completely unclear how to prove it. Unless you want to right, unless you want to prove existence, but then again, it's still, as far as I understand, it's still open. Even the existence of sort of regular maximizer is still open. Yeah, so this is a difficult the point. This is a difficult problem, and it's not clear what to prove. So I want to look at something, something similar. Yeah. Does the Schroeder change if the boundary is not smooth enough? Yeah. So you expect that sort of the, you look at the maximizer in a sort of reasonable class where yes. the eigenvalues exist. Yeah. And yeah. So and so those are supposed to be that. So you expect them to be reasonably smooth. Particularly, you probably expect them to be smooth. But for example, with only angles and uh, piecewise smooth would be uh, sufficient to have a result. Yeah, Lipschitz, Lipschitz is enough for existence. Lipschitz for example. is enough. Okay. But but you can the relax it further. Yeah. The existence of a unique maximum, for, for example, mu2. Uh, yeah, for mu2, for mu2, you know, we know the existence. For higher, we don't know the existence. Uh, but for mu2, uh, do you need the assumption smooth? To have the fact that it's a union of two balls. I don't think. No. no. You need to add something. Lips is probably, Lips okay. is probably enough. Yeah. Basically, as long as the spectrum is discrete, you can you can oh. apply the, the techniques. All right. So those are good questions, and they will come up when I slightly change the setting. All right. So in this setting, it's kind of hard to come up with anything. Uh, uh, beyond the second eigenvalue. So let me show you where we can actually hope to do a bit better. And the point is that you extend the range of possible objects you're looking at, right? So here you're only looking at uh, domains in Rn or domains in R2. And so your, your only parameter is sort of the curve, the boundary curve, right? So I'm going to extend it to slightly more general setup where now I'm looking at the surface with a metric. Right, so before I had a flat object and sort of the boundary was my only variable. So now I'm fixing the manifold and I'm changing the metric, I'm changing the shape of the surface in an arbitrary way without restricting that it should be embedded in some way. Some way. Um, right, so I have just closed Riemannian surface and on this object you can still introduce the Laplace operator, which serves exactly the same purpose as Laplace operator on a plane. Right, so it still describes sound and heat propagation, but only on curved shapes instead of the flat shapes. I have the formula here. I know no one really, no one really uses this formula for slides, unless you're me. Uh, you use it for cal calculations, right? But the point is that if G is a density matrix, it becomes the, the previous one, right? And that's uh, invariant under change of coordinates, et cetera, et cetera. So it's, Formula you can work with if you want to compute something. There's invariant definition for this, but the point is that you can define it and it's exactly the same properties. Uh, and you now consider the eigenvalue problem like this, uh, where the difference is that you don't need any boundary conditions here. And the point, the, the reason for it is because it's it's a closed surface. You can think about torus, for example, and then your boundary conditions just become sort of periodic conditions. The fact that function closes up, and uh, uh, and I'm considering compact connected manifolds, right? So there's no problem with going to infinity. Um, and in this setup, similar to the situation for domains, the spectrum is discrete. Uh, it has similar interpretations in terms of heat distribution. Um, and what we want to study, we want to study a similar question what, for which, uh, say, for which domain, for which metric, the first eigenvalue would be the biggest. So previously what we did, we fixed the volume of a domain and the optimized eigenvalue. It's the same as considering this normalized quantity, All right? So here, if you, if you look at previous formula, so that's one thing it's useful for, you can see if you multiply the metric by a constant, then the eigenvalue which change will be divided by this constant. So this quantity is scaling value, All right? So it's the same as fixing the area or you can consider this. And then the question is, to consider this as a function on metrics, we fix M, and fix K, and G the available variable. And you want to understand what the uh, when I say from one 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 one
uh, it's this this might exist it exists and so what's so special about them and can we characterize them exactly so let me answer one of those questions uh so first of all the first result in this direction was Chen Ben Yang Yao who proved that the, the indeed the first eigenvalue is bounded uh, so for any metric you have an upper bound which depends only on topology of m Right, so the point here is that right hand side is independent of the metric G. And so uh, the supremum among all G will be bounded. And moreover, uh, this linear bound in gamma is optimal. So you can look at, say, hyperbolic metrics. And for hyperbolic metrics, um, you can obtain the existence. So it's related to Zellberg one quarter conjecture, but you call this result as 3 16th version of it. Where you can show that they, they indeed they exist surfaces with large first eigenvalue, in particular, grow linearly with gamma. All right, so this is sort of at least in the order of growth, this is an optimal optimal result. And moreover, you can do the same for high eigenvalues, although the constant is not necessarily explicit. So the main point of all of this is that uh, indeed the uh, super among all metrics is a finite number. So you can ask a question as of where the maximize exists and what's so special about it. And it's here that the minimal surfaces still appear. What are the known examples here? So let me describe some first classical examples. So this is the result of Hirsch that the maximum is achieved on the standard metric on the sphere. So if you look at the sphere and all metrics on the sphere, then again, sort of the same result you expected for Neumann eigenvalues where you get something round. Same thing is true here, you get the usual round metric, and it's a unique maximizer. So you can view this as a generalization of the result of Segur, and yet the proof is very similar. Um, for projective plane, uh, the proof is somewhat different. Uh, and again, the maximum is a standard round metric. And finally, for, for the torus, the maximum is a flat torus. But not just any flat torus, it's a flat torus and it's a collateral, collateral lens. There's just some sort of most symmetric flat net you can come up with. And looking at those examples, you might think so the first one is metric of constant curvature, right? the second one is metric of constant curvature. There's also flat metric constant curvature. And I already mentioned hyperbolic metrics. So you might have temptation to think that constant curvature has something to do with this. Yeah. You said M was a Riemann surface. But I suppose you don't need a really complex structure. You could just say M is a Riemannian. Riemannian. Yeah, that's what I that's what I intended to say. I'm not sure what I said. I think that's what's written. Okay. I might I might have said Riemann surface because in my head it's all the same. Yeah. So what I mean is just it's just a logical surface really. Mm -hmm. It's just a surface, and then we changing the metric on it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, so you, there's a temptation to think, looking at those examples, there's a temptation to somehow uh, bring in curvature. But it turns out curvature has nothing to do with this. Uh, and let me explain what, what does have to do with it. What kind of geometry is involved in obtaining those results? And for that, I'm going to look at uh, criticality condition. Mm -hmm. So as I said, we're looking at this lambda one as sort of functional of the metric. All right, so let's see what does it mean that the metric is a critical point of this function. All right, so this is a computation that was done by Nadirashvili for the first eigenvalue and then Sufi Elias for the uh, arbitrary eigenvalue. So suppose I have this mg and it's critical for this k eigenvalue. So the derivative is zero in the appropriate sense. And the, the scaling property that I said. Uh, by this scaling property, you can guarantee that the first eigenvalue is anything, any number you want. I'll choose two. We'll see in a second why two is a, is a correct choice. Um, so the conclusion is that in the corresponding eigenspace, you can find a collection of eigenfunctions. Right? So this phi, uh, so it's a vector consisting of eigenfunctions in this lambda k eigenspace. And it has two important properties. First is that the sum of squares is one. So it's, some, it's a point-wise condition on collection of eigenfunctions. 
But in particular, it already tells you that uh, the eigenspace has to be multiple, right? So you cannot have a simple eigenvalue as uh, critical. Yeah, because this condition, if there's only one function, this condition would say that uh, it's a constant function. And moreover, so this essentially tells you this, this is a map from mg to a sphere. And the second condition is, in fact, it's isometric immersion to the sphere. So if you induce the metric from the round sphere, you'll get back the original metric you started from. Right? So it's, it's a very strong condition because it's a collection of functions and the sum of squares equals one. It's already a pointwise, a pointwise condition and collection of functions. And there's also this additional condition that identifies the metric. Right, so it's strong, curious condition, but just by just looking at it, yeah, you're making the correct face. So, make, so what, right? So this is some sort of condition, but what does it mean? Can you say something about n, small n? Right, so small n, the best you can say is that it's bounded by multiplicity of, uh, by the dimension of a okay. case. There is, for surfaces, there is an upper bound in terms of topology, right? So you can bound multiplicity by that linear function in, in topology of mm -hmm. M and K. So there's some sort of a priori upper bound, mm -hmm. uh, but you cannot say much better than that. Mm -hmm. Like the important thing is that you cannot even guarantee this is basis. So this collection of U1, UN plus one does not have to be a basis. It could be, it could span some subspace. Right, so what does this mean? Right. So what's, what's so special about those things? And that's where minimal surface comes in. Uh, so let me, do a crash course in minimal surfaces, which is a course in pictures. So this is a minimal surface. Uh, so the, the point is that minimal surfaces, they are connected to uh, soap films. So whenever you take, whenever you put something in soap water and then you take it out, the resulting surface is a minimal surface. Right? So soap film that tries to minimize the area is spanned by it, right? Somehow the, the, the corresponding energy in physics is the area of the surface, right? So in case, if you put just the usual, um, usual round uh, wand, I guess they call it, in, in, the, in the business of making bubbles, they call it a wand. Yes, they try to pretend that they're magicians, right? So they put the wand in the soap film, take it out, you get the magic minimal surface, right? Something that minimizes the area given the boundary data, right? So it's obvious, at least intuitively, that it's, if it's something planar, something like a circle, and you put it in, and you take it out, you get exactly the plane, right? So plane minimizes the area, yes. right? So then uh, if you do something more complicated, so the next complicated thing you can do, you can put two, th two circles in, right? And if you put two circles in, you get this. This is more like magic, right? So this, I think this can be called a wand, because when you take it out, you get something, something like this, right? You do not get a cylinder, which is sort of maybe the first thing that may, might pop into your head. You get something more complicated, which is this. And this is called catenoid. And mathematically, this is a surface of evolution of the graph of hyperbolic cosine. And again, mathematically, the way to check that this is a minimal surface uh, is to compute its mean curvature. So mean curvature zero, means it's minimal, right? So in this case, you can take this graph, you can introduce the, the local coordinates form the surface, you can compute mean curvature, you'll see it's zero. So that's what it means to be minimal. It's a critical for area functional under the perturbations, under local perturbations. Okay, so this is catenoid, uh, but those are minimal surfaces in our end, right? So in, in our world in the flat, uh, flat ambient space. So I'm going to be looking at minimal surfaces in the sphere, right? So now I'm imagining that I leave on the sphere, which I do accidentally. So they imagine if we are really, really on the on Earth, something, something round, uh, and we look at minimal surfaces in that, and then context, right? So where you, it's the same exact condition. That's a critical point for area, but your perturbations now restrict you to the surface of the Earth, to the surface of the sphere. And in that case, there is a beautiful connection between them and eigenwise Laplacian. So if you look at the sum submanifold in SM, so I'm gonna denote this as an immersion. Okay? So just a map from a surface to, to the sphere. 
then the minimality condition can be just expressed in terms of a Laplacian. All right, so the image is minimal if and only if it's a map by eigenfunctions. So each, each coordinate is an eigenfunctions with the same eigenvalue. Right? Somehow what Laplacian does, Laplacian computes not computes, Laplacian computes the mean curvature in the ambient RM. And the condition that mean curvature in the sphere is zero is equivalent to condition that mean curvature in RM is twice the position vector. And this is very much exactly what we saw for the extremality condition, right? So we saw that it's a map to the sphere and it's a map by eigenfunctions with the same eigenvalue equal to two, right? So that's the reason why I chose lambda k equals two. So the moral of this is that the critical metrics for eigenvalues lambda k are the same as minimal services in SN, right? So hence the title of the talk, so eigenvalues and minimal surfaces. So if you want to study uh, maximizers for eigenvalues, what you're actually studying, you're studying minimal services in spheres. From somewhat different viewpoint, people usually do. So people usually care about some analytic properties like index of minimal services, et cetera, et cetera. But here you care about very specific spectral properties of minimal surfaces. Okay, so let's see how it relates back. So we had those examples. So what do we have? We have the round metric on the sphere. So it's a maximizer. Therefore, it has to be critical point as well, right? So there, therefore, there has to be some sort of emotion, minimal emotion to a sphere. Uh, so I'll explore this in a second. Um, and for RP2 as well. So for torus, it's sort of easy to imagine. So especially for something like a square torus, say, uh, the eigenfunctions in the torus, you can do just separation of variables and you get some sines and cosines. And sine squared plus cosine squared equals one. So it's sort of easy to imagine that there's some sort of combination that gives you a map to a sphere. In this particular case, you get a minimal emotion to S5 for this torus. Right, but let's see something more explicit. So for the first two, um, so what are the eigenfunctions on the sphere? Yeah. Um, this is sort of computation you can do in spherical coordinates. Uh, uh, that, that if you take a homogeneous homo 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 on our three, three, and you're just going to take a sphere here, you get, you get an eigenfunction on, on the sphere. And it's eigen, it's eigen value for proportional to degree one. So what does it mean? Uh, so the in degree one of x, y, and z. So linear on linear polynomials are harmonic. So this uh, this space forms the eigenspace for lambda one on the sphere. Uh, the following eigenspace will consist of, for example, it will be spanned by those five. Right. So not not all uh, quadratic polynomials are harmonic, but the, these form the basis. And now the question is, so you have, we're considering first eigenvalue for the round sphere. The first eigenspace is spanned by X, Y, and Z. We know that the round metric is a maximizer. So there has to be a map by first eigenfunctions to a sphere, which is a minimal immersion. All right, so they have to be a collection of eigenfunctions such that sum of squares equals one. So in this case, it's, just sort of tautological, right? Because sphere is given by x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals one. I have x, y, and z here. So of course, it's just a density map, right? So density map here is an isometric minimal immersion. Yeah, so somehow this round sphere appears for very silly reasons, right? You might think, but what about RP2, right? So RP2 to RP2 is not, is not a notion to the sphere, right? It's a notion to the projective plane. So there has to be some sort of more convoluted way to have a map to some sphere from RP2. So what is the first eigen space for RP2? It's the, the best way to look at it is that you look at R S2 as a double cover RP2 under the antipodal map. And so any eigenfunctions in RP2 can be lifted to the eigenfunction on S2, but it will also be invariant under the antipodal map. So the eigenfunctions on RP2 are eigenfunctions on S2, which are invariant under the antipodal map, right? So antipodal map changes the sign of X, Y, and Z. 
the poly if a polynomial has even degree, then it's invariant. If it's odd degree, it's not invariant. So this degree two space is the first eigenspace for RP2. And then if the round metric is critical point, then there has to be a collection of some sort of linear combination of those degree two polynomials that gives you a map to a sphere. And that's an exercise just in playing with those polynomials. And for example, you can form something like this. And this is a famous Veronese immersion of round RP2 into S4. There are many different ways to do this, but they all differ by rotation of S4, right? This, this is the simplest way to write it down, right? So the reason round magic on RP2 appears is precisely because it can be immersed into the round sphere. Okay, but I should say that this is not the proof that they are maximizers, right? It's only proof that they're critical points. The actual proof of maximization is uh, more involved than that. All right, so what else can we say? Um, so the question of existence comes up. Right? So can we always find a maximizer? Um, in this case, for the first second value, uh, you can actually say something. So that's it's a partial result by Pichidis, uh, who proved the following. So I'm going to restrict to orientable case. Uh, so I'm going to denote the orientable surface of genus gamma by M gamma. And the theorem of Pichidis says that suppose you have this montanistic condition. I'll explain why in a second. So you have some sort of a priori condition to satisfy. If it's satisfied, then there exists the maximizing metric. And the maximizing metric is sort of as smooth as you can expect. So why does this condition, uh, where does this condition come from? Uh, so imagine if you have a maximizer for M, for M gamma minus one, for a surface of genus gamma minus one. What you can always do, you can always glue a handle to it, which is very thin and has almost no volume. You can always do this in a way that changes both eigenvalue and area by just tiny, tiny margin. So you can construct a sequence of degenerating metrics, which always converge to this value. So on M gamma, you can construct a sequence of metrics whose value of normalized first eigenvalue converges to this value. Mm -hmm. And of course, this sequence will not yield a smooth maximizer. So what this theorem says is that as long as you know that this sequence is not a maximizing sequence, there exists an honest smooth maximizer. So it's the worst thing that could happen is that the handle is going to collapse for the limit of maximizers, almost maximizers. And this uh, condition remains op open in full generality. So it's a big open question in the field. Can you prove this for all gamma? But in fact, we can observe that it's true for many gammas. Right, so that's what we had before. We had this lower bound, uh, linear in gamma, uh, which means that this condition is, of course, is satisfied for infinitely many gamma. Right? So for infinitely many gamma, you have this jump condition. And in particular, there exists a the maximizing metric. And if there exists a the maximizing metric, it's also a critical point. If it's a critical point, you get the corresponding minimal immersion. So it's some sort of first application, you get that. Uh, there exists a minimal immersion from a surface arbitrary genus to some sphere. And moreover, you can, you can prove, so this is the existence result, you can prove a regularity result, uh, which says that any maximal metric has to be smooth. So not only there exists a smooth maximizing metric uh, under the condition, but any maximal metric has to be smooth under that condition. All right, so you can conceivably define those I can write a for say C2 or C1 metrics. The theorem tells you that they cannot be maximized. Any questions? Can you see time anywhere? No, I can do this. Well, it's 38. 38. Okay. So this is concludes the part about first like values. Um, and then in the remaining 20 minutes, I will uh, talk about higher eigenvalues in a different in minimal service in different contexts. So if there are any questions now, it'd be a good place to ask them. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about this uh, lower bound. Uh, for low genus surfaces, uh, is there any improvement of this specific lower bound? The lower surfaces, uh, I think the best thing you can do 
Fullerton is like square root of gamma or something. Who's bounded? Uh, so Fullerton surfaces like psi mk, those? Yeah, this. Uh... Well, psi mk, you have uh, like genus is m times k and area as a pi k, I think. So at best, you can do some, some sort of square root of gamma. So loss of surfaces do not give you anything better than this. They give you worse, worse lower bounds. Yeah, so it's something I, should, uh, I didn't mention. So the, the only other results where you can find explicit maximizer is Klein bottle and service of genus two. As for any others, you, you don't know even, the, there's, there are no conjectures even for what should be the maximizer. Um, okay, so for high eigenvalues, uh, so now what did we have for normal eigenvalues? For normal eigenvalues, we had a, a sphere or a ball for the first eigenvalue and two balls for the second. And then for higher, who knows? We had some pictures, but you don't know how to show them. All right, so what happens for higher eigenvalues on surfaces? So first of all, you can prove exactly the same thing for the second eigenvalue. If you look at the sphere, the maximizer on the sphere will be two spheres glued together. Mm -hmm. And somehow the proof is uh, somewhat similar, in fact. I believe the, the actual result is the backwards, right? So first, then Jirashvili proved this, and then Nagyas and Jirashvili were used to prove the Neumann result for the second eigenvalue. All right, so this is the first time second eigenvalue was treated, and then the planar case was followed uh, after. But the, the true miracle here is that the hell stays Put, right, it doesn't break loose, it stays in hell. So you're, you have two spheres here. Well, for the fair eigenvalue, you get three spheres. So it stays, it stays in, in its own path, it doesn't go anywhere. You don't get any crazy pictures with three spheres and then glued together in some convoluted way. Uh, and moreover, it's not only a phenomenon for the sphere, the same thing happens for RP2. So what you can do for RP2, you can take, I, yeah, I used to draw pictures, uh, but for RP2, it's very hard. So you can look at RP2 and glue S2 to it in the same fashion, right? So the resulting surface will still be homeomorphic to RP2. You cannot glue two RP2s together because you get the Klein bottle, but you can still glue RP2 and S2 together. And it turns out that this is a maximizer. Right, so well, there is general phenomenon here. Uh, and in fact, this can be proved, right? So we were able to prove this in full generality for spheres and projective planes. All right, so for k in a sphere, you get this general upper bound. So for smooth metric, you always have an upper bound, strict upper bound by eight pi k. And you can always achieve eight pi k by gluing k spheres together. Right, so in particular, this is the maximizer. That's what I mean is that this situation is, um, from a mathematical viewpoint, is much nicer compared to situation in the plane. Right? So here you can actually prove things to any k. Um, and there was prior to this, there was uh, some numerical evidence to this, uh, because it's indeed what happens. And for RP2, the same is true. So now the expression is slightly different. But again, this expression is given by uh, RP2 and you glue k minus one sphere to, spheres to it. Uh, so there's always, always upper bound in those terms, and you can always achieve it by this gluing procedure. And so you have this result. And the proof of this uh, essentially uses the theory of minimal surfaces, in particular theory of minimal surfaces uh, with topology of RP2 and S2 respectively. Right, so as I said before, Basically, studying critical metrics is the same as studying minimal surfaces. So for RP2 and S2, there's a very nice description of minimal surfaces homeomorphic to RP2 and S2 in general ambient spheres. Uh, so it's description using Riemann surfaces, so complex, complex structure. Uh, and you can use this to prove this result. Right? So you can pr prove some very precise statements about minimal surfaces, which allow you to conclude this. If you just take around spheres and then actually see why it is not conical. No. So I'm, yeah, so I'm saying there's a, so for conical similarities, we have strict in the form. 
So the situation it's not it's not chronic osmotic yeah. it's it's some sort of degenerate yeah. yeah. metrics converging to the so we've got to in what sense. But yeah. the problem is if we two spheres grouped yeah. together is that technically it's not a sphere. So that's one of, I mean you can probably come up with some right? because two spheres grouped together. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it's a singular maybe because I'll I'll say I'll tell you why um, why I don't I'm not bothered by this <laughs> uh, because uh, so close cousins of minimal sources are harmonic maps and for harmonic maps you have this bubbling phenomenon that uh, you get bubbles blown out because it's confirming the invariant problem you get those bubbles blown out of points so in proof that's how they come up. So the sphere blown out, it's, it's actually just the bubble, bubble formation for harmonic maps, which is very natural. So there's, there's no reason to fight it, essentially. So I'm not, that's why I'm not tempted to introduce some larger class, to somehow say it's a larger class, it's, it's something nice. It's already something nice, it's a bubble. And again, for case like in values on other surfaces, nothing is known, even the second like in value on a torus, for example, is, is widely open. People expect that something like this happens, that maximizers are glued from the maximizers for uh, small eigenvalues, but no one knows how to do it. Presumably, similar approach could be taken, but then description of minimal surfaces is much more complicated in that case. Okay, so in the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about different eigenvalue problem where you have very similar picture, right? Somehow the, the things to keep in mind is everything we just said about closed surfaces. Very similar things will happen here. All right, so it's a surface is the boundary. And people want to get something similar, some connection to minimal surfaces uh, in the world of surfaces boundary. So it turns out that Neumann condition considered at the beginning is not the right one. If you do it for Neumann, you don't get this nice correspondence to minimal surfaces. But for the Steklov problem, you do. So the, prob the Steklov problem is as follows. So you look for harmonic functions on the interior and your eigenvalues in the boundary conditions. That normal derivative is proportional to the function on the boundary, and this coefficient is the eigenvalue. Um, and we do exactly the same thing. Uh, we look at, you get, if the surface is compact, you get a nice sequence of eigenvalues going to infinity. The goal is to maximize this quantity where now I'm normalizing by length because that's how it scales and somehow the, all the spectral business is happening on the boundary. So it's natural to normalize by length. The actual answer is that for this normalization, you get connection to minimal surfaces that you wouldn't get for any other normalization. Um, and then you look at this soup mongol matrix. So for a unit disk, the, the computing eigenvalues on unit disk is very similar to computing eigenvalues in the round sphere. You have, you look at homogeneous polynomials on R2, homogeneous harmonic polynomials on R2, and you restrict them to the disk. Right, so in this case, they have this nice expression in polar coordinates, Rn sine and Rn, R2 then cosine. So the eigenvalues 0, 1, 1, 2, 2. Uh, the analog of Hirsch's result that the round sphere maximizes is uh, Feynman Weinstock that says that the usual round disk maximizes its topological class. So for simply connected surfaces, so genus zero and one boundary component, you have two pi and the maximizer is a, is a disk. Um, and you have connection to minimal surfaces, uh, where now the corresponding objects are not just minimal surfaces in sphere, they are minimal surfaces in balls, which are orthogonal at the boundary to the sphere, right? So it's a minimal surface in the ball, such that its boundary is in the boundary of the ball, Moreover, it meets the boundary orthogonally. So actually, the picture on my introductory slide was an example of that. But let me show you some other examples. So the most naive one is the equatorial disk. So equatorial disk uh, intersects the sphere at the equator and intersects it orthogonally, right? So you have a disk and then the sphere meets it like this, right angle. Uh, you can take the copy of the catenoid that I've shown you. So it's a minimal surface in R3. Uh, so if you cut it off at the right, in the right way, so that this uh, normal to the catenoid 
is orthogonal to the sphere, you'll get a three bar minimal surface in the, in the three, three ball. Uh, and this is something we don't actually know, don't say no, this exists, some given by numerical simulations. So it's three boundary components. It has dihedral symmetry. And uh, people call it trinoid, but it's uh, not, not very inspiring. Uh, so it's to be named. Mm -hmm. Very, maybe, maybe one of you. So we need a poetic name that describes its symmetries. Don't say pair of pants. Pair of pants, I don't like pair of pants because pair of pants has distinguished end. And this doesn't have a distinguished end, right? So you have an end with a belt on it. And you, can, you cannot put a belt on any of those, right? It, uh, so what's basically, give me a name. I'll put it here and I credit you if you come up with a good name. Um, all right, so that's, that's the picture. So the nice picture here, that's, uh, the, the nice stuff about all this is you can show a lot of pictures for stecklof eigenvalues. So what's, uh, and you have the criticality condition. So for chain proof, the critical metrics correspond exactly to free boundary minimal services in the ball. They prove that it's this cut noise I showed you is the maximizer for annuli. They show the maximizer for Möbius band, and it's some sort of Möbius band in B4. So this is analogous to the George Fields result for a torus, is analogous to the Klein bottle, which I didn't, I didn't talk about, but that's the uh, analogy here. And uh, something I should have mentioned here. So they proved that if surface has genus zero, then in fact, the surface will be in B3. So going back to the question about the dimension of N. So you can prove multiplicity bound, which tells you that for genus zero, you have to be in three-dimensional ball. Hence all the nice pictures, right? And people in the medical community like nice pictures. So they immediately went compute, compute the maximizer, let's draw nice pictures. So that's what happens for low number of boundary components. So first of all, three boundary components, you get this trinoid. trinoid. Uh, for four boundary components, you get something with tetrahedral symmetries. The four boundary components of the symmetry. Um, uh, for six, you get some octahedral symmetry. For eight, if you didn't see the picture, maybe I should have hidden it. If you didn't see the picture, you would have said it has to be cubical. Well, it's not. It's something with symmetry of skew cube. So you take your usual cube and you rotate top by 45 degrees. So somehow this makes it so the boundary components can be, the distances between boundary components are more equally distributed than otherwise, okay? because you have all those distances to be the same, instead of like all this, 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 this is all the same distances. And somehow that's better for reasons we don't understand. And for existence, so Petridis proved very similar result where essentially those two inequalities tell you that if, uh, if you don't have this topological degeneration, then you have an honest maximizer. And similarly, you can see that from any gamma and k, this in fact is true, All right? So why? So this is the crux, the crux of the talk. You can wake up now, <laughs> but uh, no one was sleeping. I'm just joking. Uh, so there's a connection between these two problems, Seclough problem and Plask problem. So we observed some empirical connections that somehow results for round disks, the same result for round sphere. The connection to minimal surfaces is very similar. Um, but there, in fact, there is a more explicit connection between them. So this is a uh, result joined myself and Daniel Stern and as well as uh, Alex Girard and Jean Legasse. So this is the result. So here, what is this? So M gamma is an orientable surface of genus gamma. And gamma K is a surface of boundary of genus gamma with K boundary components, right? So it's essentially M gamma with K holes in it. So the result is that this in fact converges as K goes to infinity to this. So as number of boundary components increases, the maximal value here converges to maximal value here. And in fact, uh, if you take the gamma, this is step spike. This converges tells you that for infinitely many k, this is, uh, this is achieved, right? So those two inequalities in the previous slide are achieved. And somehow, if you have a gap between the values of m gamma, 
from this convergence, you can conclude the gap between the corresponding values for uh, for n gamma phi. And to finish off, so those are the pictures for gamma equals zero, as k goes to infinity. And you can see something something that happens. Uh, so the things to keep in mind is that if you put gamma equals zero, the maximizer here is a round metric. And the round metric is just, a, just the usual sphere. And this looks more and more like a sphere. So essentially what they proved, they proved the geometric counterpart to this. Okay, so geometric counterpart is this. So I take M such that it's achieved. Then there are infinitely many Ks such that this exists. So the corresponding free boundary minimal surface exists. Corresponding minimal surface in the sphere exists. So we proved that in fact, those geometric objects converge. So the free boundary minimal surfaces on the left converge in the Hausdorff sense, for example, to the corresponding minimal surface in the sphere. Right, so it's exactly what happens here. Uh, 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 here, right? So they become closer and closer to the boundary. Right, and a priori, it's not even clear that such things could be possible, right? Because the condition on the right hand side is that the, those boundary components are orthogonal, which is very far from being close to, right? Orthogonal is the opposite to being close to as far away as possible. But they are equidistributed somehow, these holes, and they go in the smaller and smaller amount. And moreover, the boundary measures converge with twice the surface measure, right? So these holes on the boundary, they're equidistributed in this weak, weak sense. Um, what time do I have? We probably not none. Okay, I'll show, I'll, show, I'll show this. So we can also prove uh, some quantity bounds on the difference. Uh, so if you consider, so we know what this converges to this. In fact, we know that this is less or equal than this. Uh, so the difference between them grows like decays, decays like log k over k. And we can prove the fact that for some surfaces, it's in fact, it's an optimal rate of decay. So it indeed decays like k over k. And there are some geometric reasons for that. For example, you would think that all the holes, they are, look like scaled copies of this catenoid that you saw before. And this kind of, this mode k over k here is consistent with that intuition. Although it's not how to prove. Um, and some open questions. This is the cool one, one. So we know that mode k over k is there is more and more is there some constant here, here. Um, um, and there are some open questions for high dimensional manifolds, right? So something uh, which I didn't talk at all. I was only talking about surfaces. And the meta question for the end. Let's acknowledge you in, in the math talk. So it has to be a meta question. Uh, so we, we saw two instances for this correspondence between some, some critical points for eigenvalue functionals and some natural generic objects. So the question is how ubiquitous is it? So we saw two instances. There are two more instances that appeared recently. Right, so for conformal Laplacian, you can associate something which, uh, at least for the first eigenvalue, it gives you the Yamabe problem, something else. And then we have joint work in progress for Dirac operator, where you get some sort of harmonic maps to or minimal surfaces in projective planes. But in general, it's, it's, it's something anyone can do. Take the favorite eigenvalue problem and see if there's some geometric counterpart to it, right? It's not clear. In fact, for some problems, there is none. Uh, for some problems, there might be, and whenever there is such a case, it's always, you can try to do all the same stuff, and you might discover some interesting geometric consequences. In it. All right, do you have a thank you slide? I don't. Okay, thank you. Hilbert Amon ever thought about Dirac? No, he has some work about it, but... Uh, um, 
So there was one work of uh, Ben Salman in like 2003 about Dirac eigenvalues, but he had correspondence like this, but his correspondence is only for the first time. It's not very natural. So part of what we're doing is to extend it to higher eigenvalues, um, which, yeah, which you can do, yeah. And another question, in like biological membranes, there, there is uh, some sort of deformation of the minimal surfaces where a certain area you you add something to, so you get some some kind of, uh, in, in some physics systems, there are some functionals which are yeah. uh, sort of related to, to minimal surfaces, but not quite that. I wonder if there is any spectrum interpretation of those. I mean, that's a, always a good question. We, we are looking at this uh, from here to here, right? So we're saying, take the favorite eigenvalue problem. Let's look at the criticality condition and see if it corresponds to anything. You can conceivably do that. You can start from this and try to reverse engineer a problem, given the, uh, given the equation. The yeah, but again, the, it's not clear that you can do that. But that's the that approach. Um, it's certainly much more difficult because that's a creative question, right? So okay, you looking at geometric objects come up with an eigenvalue problem. Um, it's much more difficult than just I have an eigenvalue problem, it's just compute the derivative and see what happens. Uh, yeah, it, it's possible, but yeah, it's either going to be discovered by chance or if someone will do this reverse engineering. Yeah. I noticed when you talked about the convergence of the spectral eigenvalues to the with the ANS capability with the lambda one um, that you assumed orientability, right? Yeah, that's just for notation. Okay, because later it was some insult about the decay rate for the claim part. Of yeah, yeah. So the uh, yeah, non orientable things are hard because what kind of notations are you supposed to use to denote an orientable thing? Uh, right, so you can put the hat on top, but then you need to explain what the hat is. Uh, so that's the main problem is that I didn't want to explain, I didn't want to give a notation for non-orientable things. Yeah, but all the same is true. If the existence results are still true for non-orientable, there's corresponding gap conditions, which are more complicated because you have more ways to degenerate uh, because you can collapse to an, to, to an orientable thing. You can collapse to the... But again, the same natural things are true if you're, if there's no collapse and then exists the maximizer, you can prove that maximizer exists for infinitely many uh, genera, for infinitely many number of boundary components, and the same sort of result is true. Yeah, excuse me. Um, is there any kind of a whale kind of asymptotic law force for this high eigenvalues in the, uh, for the case of uh, right. plus eigenvalues for the torus or in the Sketch of case. Is there yeah, so that's uh, so if you're asking about um, say you look at the sigma uh, sigma 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 i of n k and you'll send i to infinity, for example. Right? So you can you can show it for orientable things, it behaves like two pi i plus small o. Uh, so that's uh, that's, so that's in some sense a while law for the maximizers. Is that the question? Uh, it's no dependence on the volume. There's no dependence on the volume because it's scale invariant quantity. Volume, dimension, genus, none of them. Nothing. No, it's it's uh, it's completely universal. I mean, the normalized like in has an area in it, right? So sigma sigma i is a soup of Big sigma i is a super normal roll matrix. Maybe I can go back. Right, so the area is, is the length of the boundary, I guess, in this case. Length of the boundary is in the definition here. So if you incorporate this, you'll have a dep dependence on the length of the boundary. But otherwise, it's completely universal. The constant is 2 pi, independent of the topology. But the corresponding questions for other, so this is for orientable things with Stuckloff boundary. But for any other situation, it's open. What happens for the closed case? What happens for non-orientable? Yeah, mainly for compact uh, orientable Riemannian manifold, closed compact orientable Riemannian manifold. And can we expect such, so like for the Torres case, such as yes, 
Yeah, you can expect it, yeah, for sure. But we don't know how to prove it. I mean, you can already see it for the sphere, right? So for the sphere, you can see this as a wires law. Like this is this is a wires law, although it's very yeah. eight by k, k second wire is eight by k. Yes, law. Second one uh, here, it's eight by k plus smaller of one. Right, so you can expect similar results for the torus, but we don't know how to prove this. So this this result somehow it's it's overkill in this case because you just characterize all the values and then extract asymptotics from there. One can expect it for torus. Say you might be able to prove asymptotics without finding all the maximizers, but it's still it's an open question for sure. Yeah. Okay, thanks. It's a bit weird because I, I'm looking I'm looking at the screen, but there's no. There's, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Going back to the very beginning of your talk, so it was sort of later domains, you look at domains in the sphere or the hyperbolic plane. Yeah. Uh, does it make sense to look at similar problems? Sure. Well, yeah, I expect to get the same I mean, kind of thing. I'm not, sure, but for I, I, I'm not uh, for lambda two, you might get something, for but I would say it's lambda three already, you will get something similar. You don't expect anything nice. I'm not sure if it's proven. Do you know if it's proven for the second value? Something easy. I think for hyperbolic, it's easy. It's more or less easy. But for a sphere, there's some problems with if you can fit the domain inside. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah. I think the first two you you might you want you you can check. And it might be non trivial. Anything higher would be the same problem. All right. So uh, we can continue the discussions uh, upstairs over the wine and cheese. So let's send the speaker again for the talk.